the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 700. Woohoo! <laughs> For Monday, March 12th, 2018. <laughs> to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Up, the show that takes your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, all of it. We mix it all together. We share answers. We share everything here with the goal of learning at least five new things every single episode. That's every week, every time we get together, the goal, all of us, every one of us, me included, five new things, two New sponsors for this episode that include Ring, where at ring.com slash MGG, you can save up to 150 bucks on some killer packages that they've put together for their uh, video doorbell and um, floodlight cam. These things are awesome. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. And also Molecule uh, with a K, M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E. -E. This air purifier is simply put freaking amazing and coupon code MGG save you uh, 75 bucks. So we'll talk more about that later too here in Durham, New Hampshire with uh, evidently Peter Brady helping me crack my voice. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in fearful Connecticut, John F. Braun. How you doing, Mr. John F. Braun? Oh, just recovering from a uh, latest Nor'easter. It's show 700. So I, I, I figured we can't do this without... Oh, oh, here in another part of Durham, New Hampshire. Pilot Pete, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, show yeah. 700. That's pretty cool. A nor'easter. Boy, was that fun or what? They said 8 to 12 inches in our area. I think what they meant was to put 8 plus 12 yeah, inches. Yeah, we got a we lot. Got, we got slammered. Yeah, yeah, we got 20, 22 inches of heavy, wet snow. Yep. Oh, <laughs> and my snowblower's broke, so I that got it sucks. all by hand. Oh, yeah. oh no, no, no. Yeah. That's not okay. My youngest Come got some mine. of the deck done, and oh. then, then his back hurt. Okay, yeah. I get it, pal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I um. So we lost power here. It, 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 it came back, but uh, we lost power. Actually, it, it, we lost it late on Wednesday night, and then it came back for about an hour, just long enough for me to wake up, go turn all the UPSs on, because uh, the UPSs, of course, when the power goes out, the UPSs start beeping, and that's annoying. So it's just like, okay, we know it's going to be off for a while, so we just go power them all off. Yeah. yeah, and then. Uh, and then the power came back on. I was asleep. Lisa was up. And so she kind of woke, uh, you know, and heard like coming back to bed or whatever. She woke me up and it was like, oh, cool. Power's on. Great. So I went around. I turned everything on. And as I was turning the last one on, I'm thinking, you know, we're still due to get like another 10 inches of snow. And it was right at 32 degrees. So this snow was wet and heavy, like Pete said. And I thought, yeah. I, I am, is this a fool's errand? Like my, my, it doesn't matter. Cause I had just turned the last one on. So I go up to bed literally as I'm climbing into bed, I see the clock next to the bed go off. It's like, yep, here we go. So I just, it didn't, I, I went back downstairs. I turned all the UPSs off again, got back into bed, um, looking at, uh, various reports from my routers and, and like my thing box and things like that. The power actually came back on again throughout the night and then went off. It was off for, Almost exactly 24 hours for us, but, um, midday yesterday, you know, I got a, uh, I got an email that, uh, one of our ad agency uh, contacts needed like information for a proposal ASAP. And it was like, Oh, well got to deal with that. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This could be a big, big campaign. Like they're in a, you know, this new client that they brought on is on a rush and it's great. It's cool. And it's actually a great client. And you know, that actually we've dealt with before in a different way. So I was like, how quickly do you need it? I called him and he's like, yeah, you know, pretty much ASAP. So I thought, okay, wait a minute. You know, I've got the generator going. I had the generator. We have the house and the office are on separate feeds from the street. And so while I was out there, like kind of clearing off some of the snow, we let the office run for a little bit just to heat up the hot water pipes. And then we cut it over to the house for the rest of the day so that we'd have like power in the house and we could, you know, do stuff and cook and watch TV or whatever. And so before I cut it over to the house, I thought, you know, 
The Comcast line often is alive, even when we don't have power. And sure enough, I powered up instead of just powering up the boiler, which is what I had powered up. I flipped the switches to power the office up. And sure enough, within about five minutes, uh, you know, everything had powered up and I watched the cable modem sync up just fine to the uh, Comcast signal. And so I had Wi-Fi in the office and it was like, okay, sweet. So I sat there on the couch in the office with my laptop. I didn't bother turning on the iMac or anything and did the, you know, put together the proposal, sent it out to him. All good. Great. Powered the office down. Uh, and then we went out to lunch and then we came back and powered up the house. But, you know, you can you can cobble these things together if you just stop and think like, all right, what tools do I have at my disposal <laughs> that I yeah. can use? And it worked out pretty well. So, you know, nice. all's well that ended well. Yeah. We're usually the first ones to lose it. I was shocked we didn't. So Yeah. Our neighborhood here is it's older. You know, it's, yeah, the houses are a bunch of trees in your neighborhood. Day. It's <laughs> it is. Yeah. 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 And the lines are all up on the poles and the lines so. are all on the poles. Yeah. yeah. So you didn't you did not lose power. Is that right, Pete? Uh, no. The whole That's time. Good. Not even a flicker. I was shocked. Wow. Yeah. Oh. How, and John, you didn't lose power. I didn't. But about 25 percent of my town did. Hmm. I got real lucky. But I was going to say, that's a lot. I, I mean, here, 25% is like low. But for you, I, that from what, from what you've told me over the years, it seems like that's a significant amount uh, for your area. Yeah. Well, I think most of it was, you know, trees and wires down. And uh, there's uh, less of those in my area, or at least uh, I actually got the branches trimmed. For sure. The homeowners insurance company at one point. So there's less of a possibility of bad things happening to my house. Like It's pressure. interesting that your homeowner's insurance would do that. Um, I was going to say your electric company will generally do some level of that if it's touching oh, they're doing, the wires. Yeah, yeah. I've actually noticed. Oh, they do that too. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway. this, was, this was over the house. Oh, but, that's different. But the co power company is doing a trimming program as well. Cool. Some of the tr tree huggers don't like that, but hey. Hey, that's not nice, John. They've that's done a not much better nice. job, though. This, at least in our area, they've done a much better job. So I think that's probably why we didn't lose it. Because in years past, we've been yeah. horrible. But yeah. anyway. All right. Hey, I bet uh, you guys want to talk Mac let's move, stuff. Let's move on to the show. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, okay. So uh, Les actually had a question that we held over from last week. And I am going to apologize. I, I told that story at the beginning of the show, A, because it's interesting. But B, uh, the weather for all of us, John, you had some sewer-related stuff go on. And so we are under prepped today i think we've got enough actually for the first show we always are over prepped so really i'm probably apologizing and or, or at least you know setting the bar for no reason whatsoever we do have some great sponsors this week and i really encourage you to check them out we'll give you the links and stuff and we'll tell you more about them but um, but these are very cool things um some of them both of them have actually changed things in my house dramatically in the last two weeks so please check out those links that that's all we ask is, is that you check out the links for the sponsors uh you don't have to buy anything obviously if it's something you want to buy great if not that, as always that's just how it works our job is to get you to go check out what they're offering and it's their job to convince you that it's good for you so all right uh with that and thank you for everything it's show 700 thank you like seriously wow. all of you that's thank a you a lot of shows it's a lot of shows. Thank you. I, I don't know how, how better to say it than that, that we can sit here, you know, 700 episodes later. Um, What's the anniversary in June? Anniversary is in June. June 13th Seven, will be 13 years. 13. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the 13th. I want to say it's the 13th, but, it, but something in my head says the 12th, but I don't think that's right. Yeah. All right. Anyway, now on to Les. Uh, Les asks, asks, uh, over the years, iTunes has become more and more picky as to what videos it will play and or transfer to the iPhone or iPad. On a recent MGG, I learned of a command to convert videos that were unplayable on iTunes. The problem is that at one time, I would get an alert box warning me that certain videos would not transfer, transfer to my iDevice because uh, they couldn't be played on it. I would try to convert the videos one at a time to mixed results. After much, much frustration, I checked the Don't Show Me This Again box. Is there a way to undo this? I would like to see which videos were unplayable and try to convert them with the command I learned from the show. So, yeah, it, it is a per device. Uh, it, iTunes has a per device memory uh, for this kind of stuff. So you need to plug in your device or at least connect your device. If it's connected Wi-Fi, that's fine. Go to it. Um, 
And then when you're in iTunes, scroll down. So you click on the device that's in now iTunes. It's just like a tiny little device icon in like the, the top of the iTunes window. But once you're there, scroll down on the main screen of that, scroll down to the options setting on that first screen, and you'll see a reset warnings button. It's below the whole like automatically sync with this phone is connected sync on Wi-Fi where they convert higher bit rate songs setting is all that stuff right below it is a reset warnings button and you click that and it will reset for that device on that copy of iTunes. So if you've done this from other machines or, or whatever, or you've got multiple iDevices, devices, that's more likely you're going to need to do this for each of them. So there you go. That seems like a lot of work. I it, well, it's iTunes. I mean, you know, remember, they've been piling yeah. more and more, more features. Like and cramming it in there. I get yeah, just that. cramming it in. I got an easier solution. What's that, Pete? Well, let's go get a new iPhone. Well, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> would, would that do it, though, if he inherited his iCloud oh, backup? Oh, maybe that wouldn't. Yeah. I don't know the answer to yeah, that. I but, don't either, but I bet that. But yeah, I would, I would, I would that that, put an asterisk that on it. That flag is tagged. Yeah, be that way. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Have to I don't start know. over from new. Yeah, yeah. So I'm glad I, I've said that as a joke. But now that's something to go. Yeah, for people to think about when they do get a new one. Why is it not working like I want? Les had a second question though, and I don't know the answer, but maybe one of you does, or John, maybe you do. Um, he says I edit the metadata metadata of video files in iTunes director notes star rating. As I type the information in, I get a list of suggestions, which would be great, except they include every fat fingered mistake I've ever made ever. This gets in the way of words I'd actually, you know, like to use. Is there a way to edit or start the suggestions fresh? I don't know the answer there. I feel like spotlight would be, you know, kind of at the core of this, but I don't know. Um so maybe rebuilding the spotlight index would do it. I don't know. I don't know. Thoughts on that, John? I mean, once you manually change the data, you could see what pref file or files have been updated, and that may give you a pointer as to where that data is stored. That could be a chore. Oh, that's true. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. All right, man. You want to take us to Steven? Yes. Got an update from Stephen. So this one was really bizarre, but I uh, thought I'd share it because Stephen writes, "Hi guys, my MacBook Pro early 2011. Wow, will not turn on. The power cord usually has either a green light or a yellow light. Now I have no light. I tried another power cord with the same results. Does this mean the battery is bad? I've been using the app." You talked about on MGG that cycles and checks battery life. It said it was still good. I'm not sure what to do next. Well, I'm almost certain what it is, Dave. Okay. But I was wrong. But okay. Well, <laughs> my no, best tell, guess in tell this us case. what you thought it was, because it might be what it is for someone else. Yeah. Yes. Um, there is a component uh within that Mac or anything that use Mag, uses MagSafe called the MagSafe DC in board. Because the thing is with MagSafe, um, there's actually a little dance that happens between the adapter and the computer where it does a little negotiation. You know, and they talk to each other to figure out the capabilities and stuff like that. Uh, and if that board's bad, then you won't get a light. Or so I thought. And actually, you can, you can see th this information. So I had kind of a brain fart here and that I told him this when he said his machine wouldn't turn on. But the thing is, if, you, if the machine did turn on, you could go to system information, hardware, power, and then there's, there should be a listing that says AC charger information. It'll tell you things like it's connected, the ID, the wattage, revision, serial number, all that stuff. Um, so if you think you're... you're something's wrong with your system, you can look there to see how much power should be um, coming out. Fortunately, iFixit does have a little ditty on how to do this repair. And I think we'll link to this, and I pointed him to this. Um, and they also sell the part. Now, the thing is, the difficulty, uh, from what I recall reading that article, the, it's a very, they claim it's a very difficult 
repair. It sa- it, I'm just looking at the part and looking at it. I mean, it's a very simple part in the grand scheme of things, but just looking at it, it's like, oh, dude, to get to where you could unplug and replug this thing, probably not easy. Yeah, you'd have to tear the whole machine apart. Yeah. So, um, yeah. um, now the only thing is, so that's a 2011 machine. You know what that means, Dave and Pete? It's in vintage status. I was going to say, oh, so Apple won't work on it. And that's what I said. So I said, Apple is almost certainly not going to do anything for you. But if you find an Apple authorized service provider, they may work on it. That's good to remember. Yeah. So that was my closing advice there. And then he got back to us. And here's the weird part. So he says, a follow-up on my problem. I took my MacBook Pro to an Apple authorized service provider, the Mac guys in Costa Mesa, California. And they found my system software, High Sierra, was corrupt. This most likely was due to low RAM. I've maxed out my RAM and it's working great. Before I added the RAM, the Mac would take forever to wake up and now it wakes fast. Huh. Uh, It's like, huh? So I'm like, you know, I'm glad they solved your problem, but based on the initial email, I would have never guessed that it was a system software problem. So the machine wouldn't charge. It wouldn't even turn on and somehow that was system software. That's what he said. They said. So how did they get it to turn on, though? I realized I might be asking a, a question to which we don't have the answer, but. Uh, my guess would be that they probably put in a charged battery and were able to start up the machine and then it got into a state where it was OK again. I OK, that I will believe. Yeah, something needed to happen to the hardware. I, I there's there's some magic reset like a like a, you know, uh, SMC reset kind of thing, although it sounds like that sort of already happened by default here or. Remember, and I don't, Macs don't have this anymore, but there used to be a CUDA button, C U D A, on the motherboard of all the, I think it was all PowerPC Macs, is what it was. And that was like the magic button. And if, you know, I remember the first time I found that, I had a client who, like, things just didn't work. And it was like, I was looking around inside. I'm like, I wonder what this red button is. And I even turned to the client, I was like, well, I'm going to push this button because nothing else is working. They're like, yeah, cool. Go and pushed it. And it was like, bing, all good. Boom. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. Um, yeah. An SMC reset would do it. Uh, maybe. So, yeah. Interesting. I mean, it could have been because the age of that machine, it could have been that the battery was so, batteries can get into what I, I think they call a deep discharge state yeah. where something like this could happen. So yeah. maybe the, the, the strategy I'm, I'm guessing what they did is they jump started the battery or gave it a little boost. Mm-hmm. And then they determined that the system software was bad. So I think it was a common, it, it was a combination of hardware and software. Yeah. But, um, That's interesting. Sounds cool. like the, those guys, uh, they got their, they got it down, man. They got it down. They, they knew they fixed it. So. That's great. Cool. On the uh, troubleshooting front, we heard from listener, David, who uh who shares uh, a tip and if i can find it there it is he says uh one other troubleshooting task i've used uh and he was we were talking about he's this is in reply to in show 699 when we were talking about that weird thing where safari was causing or safari was launching on unmounts and that sort of thing uh He said, one other troubleshooting task I've used when I get these oddities is to log out of my main user account and log back in using an admin or a test account. This lets me figure out if it's a systemic setting or a user specific setting that's giving me a better idea then of where to go and look for what the problem is. And I like especially for that problem, that is exactly the right thing to do. It can save you so much time. Um, if you don't have a test user account set up in, in that case, uh, or in that instance, it would have been easy to set one up and then go use it. That said, uh, sometimes the, the issue is that you can't even log into your account. So having a test user account set up ahead of time is my recommendation. It's what I do on all of my machines. And then that way it's just there. And if I, if I need it and if I wind up using it where I make significant enough changes and i just sort of go with my gut on what enough is then i'll wipe it out and create a new one after i'm done but otherwise if i go in and i just do one or two things or whatever i'll leave it if i feel like it's pristine enough 
then, um, then I just leave it, you know, for the next time that I need to do it. So, uh, along those lines though, we got, uh, an email from Don who shared a tale of woe that, uh, is very interestingly related. Uh, he says he's got a, uh, late 2015, 27 inch iMac running high Sierra. And he's got a one terabyte SSD running APFS with 32 gigs of RAM. And he says he runs this 24 seven because he uses it as a Plex server. He says, beginning a couple of months ago, I started to have a problem with the iMac after it had run all night. It has been my habit to run the system maintenance application cocktails, daily maintenance script. First thing in the morning cocktail would launch. But when I tried to have it run uh, what it calls essential system maintenance, Cocktail would crash and immediately relaunch. The only way to cure this behavior was to reboot the iMac, and then Cocktail would work as expected. This behavior occurred only after the machine was left running overnight. Cocktail problem occurred consistently. Another issue began to occur, albeit inconsistently, was that the desktop icons of the mounted external hard drives would disappear. Also, from time to time, when I tried to open a folder uh, alias on my desktop, I would get an error message that the alias couldn't find the target folder. Force quitting Finder would solve both the missing desktop hard drive icons and broken aliases. I took all kinds of steps that did not solve the problem. Uh, first, I completely removed and reinstalled the application cocktail. I have rebooted the Mac into safe mode and then restarted into normal mode. I ran disk utilities first aid on both the system hard drive or on the system hard drive from the recovery partition. I ran Apple's hardware diagnostic tests. I reinstalled Mac OS from the recovery partition, spent a couple hours on the phone with Apple support. All of those. No joy. The steps that I took that did solve the problem. I created a new administrative user that I called sysadmin or you know, test user, doesn't matter what you call it. Uh, and he says, and when I logged into the new account before going to bed, cocktail ran fine under this new user first thing in the morning. In addition, there were never any finder wonkiness happening while logged into this new user account. That was my clue that one or more of the programs that launched on startup and ran in the background uh, was at fault. Therefore, I removed one program per day from the list of programs that start on uh, launch on startup and he's going, he went into system preferences, user groups, and then would remove one and then let it run overnight. I did this daily until I removed drive genius from the launch on login group. Bingo. Note that I was running the latest version of drive genius. That was the solution. Removing drive genius solved the problem that I had with cocktail and the finder wonkiness. Says I haven't yet written to ProSoft to let them know of the problem I had, uh, but I will do so soon. He says I've used Drive Genius for several years uh, and have always found it very helpful. He says I'd be very sorry if it proved to be a problem under High Sierra going forward. So very, he says he is running it on his 13-inch MacBook Pro with High Sierra with no issues and certainly none of these. But that is like so super kudos to you, Don, for taking the long view of this and. Not only testing it with that other user account, because that confirmed for you that it was something in your user account. I know you had already put a ton of time in, but that saved you even more time because you were no longer guessing. You knew it wasn't your computer. It was just that user account. And then systematically, one at a time, and for you, one per day, because it was per day that you could test this once per day, um, Patience paid off, man. I, I like you. I hope I, I hope Drive Genius isn't actually the issue and that it was, you know, or isn't a long term issue for you. But um, but yeah, that's really good stuff, man. The, like, thanks for sharing that. I like it. What do you think, John? I don't know what to think anymore. No, <clears throat> no, think, good I, story. I think he's lucky that uh, D is close to the front of the alphabet. It's been many more days. <laughs> That's you true. Know, I mean, it's just. Yeah, yeah, right. That's how that. Yeah. You yeah. just kind of, you know, when I'm in a scenario like that, um, I do trust my gut. Sure. In terms of which one I disable first. Uh, and sometimes. Yeah, but, it, you know, that as you know, that that can that can also lead you astray, because who mm -hmm. would think, uh, you know, a, a program as solidly written as Drive Genius? Sure. Would, yep. No, it's true, yeah. but it, yeah, yeah, that might have made Drive Genius fall to the bottom of the list. Yeah. I'll, I'll trust my gut, though, yeah. especially for the first couple, yeah. just because you got to start somewhere and you might as well start there. 
Um, if there's a lot of things to turn off, and I this is more reminiscent of my time troubleshooting Windows than than the Mac, but the same principle applies. If there's a lot of things, I'll disable them in batches. So if there's a hundred things, let's say, I'll disable and test in batches of ten. And then that way I know, okay, all right, it was batch three. So now I just need to narrow down amongst those ten as opposed to, you know, one per day, 99 days. So. Is there a way to fool a computer to thinking that a day has passed? So you could do this. <sighs> you know, that's where that. I feel like your gut might Screw hurt you. you well, yeah, because <laughs> is it truly like, is the, the yeah. trigger for this, the clock being more forward or is it time related and has nothing to do with where the computer's uh, clock is, but you know that some app ran for a while and yeah. bloated up and ran. How many you know, clock cycles have gone by. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, right. So, yeah, sure. I mean, I don't know. You know, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Cool he, stuff. He right, solved John? it. Why am I trying to help solve it? Still? No, no. This is what we do on this show. It's all about the troubleshooting. You know, here we are. We're at like the twenty-six minute mark, and I, now I'm worried we're not going to fit everything in right. to this episode that that I was worried we didn't have enough. For. I'll be quiet now. That's okay. Hey. um, <laughs> I, I had a, I did have a thing yesterday though. My son had a problem with his iPhone, John, and it started. He it's this is I believe the model. It's an iPhone seven. It's actually my hand me down iPhone seven. It I believe the model is a sixteen sixty, and I think this particular issue that he had is is specific to that model. It's an AT and T uh, iPhone seven. So the issue started with him getting uh, no service. And, you know, he would remove his SIM card and put it back in, restart the iPhone. It was fine. And then sort of unrelated to that, he decided that he had so many apps on his phone that he really only uses like seven of them now. And he decided, you know, I'm just going to wipe my phone and start from scratch, not restore from a backup. And, you know, instead of going through and trying to delete all these apps, I'm like, well, okay, fine. So he did that. And his phone wouldn't like he did just an erase, you know, on the phone, the, the reset all pro programs and settings or whatever. And it wouldn't come back from that. It wouldn't install. So then he tried it with iTunes. This was all unbeknownst to me. Yeah. yeah. Then he came to me, uh, I don't know, a week ago or whatever. Uh, and was like, OK, hey, uh, you got a minute. I, I need your help. Like, sure. And so he tells me all this and I was like, oh, yeah, that's not good. And it would get, you know, halfway through the restore process and then stop with error number three like okay crap so i tried it on my computer both with itunes and then iMazing, just to see if i could get any error messages that meant anything no um so i booked an appointment with the with the genius bar and then i posted on facebook about it in our mac keycap group at MacGeekCap.com slash facebook and uh one of the guys dan deering who uh is the manager at mac edge our local Apple uh, authorized service provider. He uh, he said, yeah, that if it's this model iPhone, that is a known issue. And uh, and sure enough, it was. So we went to the Genius Bar yesterday and they actually didn't swap it out uh, as we were hoping. They shipped it off. So I could have just taken it to Mac Edge to do it. Right. Mac Edge was like, well, we have to ship it out. So it's like you might be better off going to the Genius Bar. In this case, no, I should have just gone to Mac Edge three or four days ago, whatever it was. But anyway. We shipped it off while we were there. We, we I always keep a spare iPhone around. Uh, so we have an old iPhone 6S that was the spare that he's been using. The battery on it shot. So uh, while we were there, we asked the genius, hey, you know, can you do a, a scan on this battery and possibly replace it while we're sitting here? He's like, yeah, sure. No problem. And then uh, he came back around after we kind of did the whole thing for the iPhone 7 that we were sending off. And. He's and oh, and by the way, you know, not to bury the lead here, but that particular repair is covered by Apple, even for an out of warranty iPhone. Uh, it it was an issue with them in, like increasing the tolerance on the EE prom that the firmware is written to presumably to help prevent jailbreaking. But they went a little too far. So not only could jailbreak firmware not be installed, but neither could Apple's firmware. <laughs> Is that a problem? <laughs> uh, yeah. So they, they think, but you know, they, they're like, oh yeah. And like, there was no issue at all. They were like, yep, you're right. It's covered. No problem. Like there was no negotiation. It was great. So, but the guy came out and he's like, look, with the snowstorm, we're backed up. My manager said, I can't squeeze you in because you don't have a separate appointment 
for this battery thing. And I'm like, wow. he's like, you know, I'm really sorry. I'm like, no, you know what? I get it. it I, I'm not going to hold it against you. No problem. He said, but go talk to them at the front. And see if maybe they can like get you an appointment and then you, you're right here. Like, okay, cool. So we go to the front and the woman was great, but she said, look, uh, it's three hours to get another, you know, a, a walk-in appointment. But she said, do you have the Apple support app? And I said, uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. She, she's like, okay, we'll launch it on the, f she said, I can book you an appointment on the phone. You can do this whole thing on the phone and, and do your battery replacement by mail, which with this particular phone is fine because it's a spare one, especially once the other one come, comes back. Sure. She's like, so do it. You know, you can either call them in the app or you can even chat with them in the app. And she said, they can do the whole diagnostic right there in the app and you don't have to. Yeah. And I, mm -hmm. Pete just had this look on his face. Like, really? Yeah. yeah. So, I told Lucas, I'm like, okay, while we're on the Wi-Fi here at the, uh, at the Apple store, download the app onto that phone. I'll drive us home. It was about a 45 minute ride home while you go in the app and, and do your thing. So he did. He started a report, uh, a support request inside the app. He chose to chat with him, but he could have done a phone request. The chat turned out to be great. Um, he got a guy. He actually told the guy everything that was going on, including the fact that we were at the store with a different iPhone. The guy was able to kind of keep all these separate thoughts in his head. He knew that this was a spare phone that we needed to use right now. But he said, you know, he went back and forth with him. OK, yep. Uh, he said, let's run a diagnostic on your phone. He said, can you go to the private? Do you know how to go to the privacy setting settings? And Lucas was like, yeah. And he goes to the privacy settings and he launches the screen. And then on the screen, like right after it comes up, a new entry appears that said start diagnostics for Apple support. And it says Apple support has requested to do diagnostics of this. Will you allow it? And so of course he started it and it ran a diagnostic. And while it, you know, once it finished Jeff, who was his, the support rep came back in the chat and was like, yep, it looks like your battery is consumed on this device. That was the, that's wow. the term they used consumed, not dead, not, you know, consumed. So, so he's like, we have three options. You can bring it to a genius bar. You can mail it in. You can bring it to Best Buy or, you know, whatever, or an app authorized Apple provider. Lucas was like, well, I'll just, we'll just mail it in. We're going to have a box from the other one that's coming back. The guy's like, great. You got to turn off, find my iPhone for me to set this up. But he's like, but then turn it back on until you get your other phone back. Then turn, find my, find my iPhone off again. But this whole remote support thing was great. I mean, that's awesome. It, yeah, yeah. Like they could do the whole thing and it wasn't, I mean, we weren't even on a Wi-Fi connection. We were driving down the highway at 65 miles an hour while Lucas did this whole support thing. And by, before we got home, it was finished and he got a link in his email. Now the link in the email was just to pay for the support request. And then we go drop it off uh, at UPS. But the, um, the payment was 35 95. So, I, I haven't gone to pay for it yet. They say, don't pay for it until you get your other phone back because that way it starts the timer on when you've got to ship it and all that. Yeah. But I'm guessing there's a $6 shipping fee that we are paying in addition to the $29 battery fee, but super easy. Yeah. And for anybody that's having trouble getting an appointment or doesn't want to have to drive back and forth to their Apple store or their genius bar or whatever, uh, like this, uh, that's, really awesome that is great they to can know about diagnose that. this stuff from remote did you know about that john yeah. doesn't when sound i right. had yeah. yes maybe oh, on a okay. mac though on a, on a mac yeah sure, i've seen sure. him do it on the mac but yeah. i've never seen him do it on iowa i didn't i just well, didn't know yeah well i think there's an entry in system info where it uh i think it was there but they said oh yeah and go to this place in system info on the Mac, and you I mean. think you can say sub yes. Yeah, and okay. I think you can yeah. uh, submit, uh, you know, a system summary. Sure. To, uh, yeah, yeah. To Apple, yes. Actually, I'm looking right now. So, system information file menu send to Apple. Yep. So uh, sometimes they'll uh, they'll take over your screen. You. I've had them do that on my Mac. I've had them completely take over the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. But yeah, I had no idea that this was possible with iOS. It's an, and it's, you know, of course, a free app from the app store. But uh, I recommend everybody put this app on your iPhone. Um, I certainly put it on mine and I mean, it hasn't caused any problems. In fact, in this case, it solved one. But yeah, having that right there, no matter where you are, as long as you've got Internet. Right. 
That's awesome. It's oh, mine, awesome. One, yeah. My, my, the, the repair that I had recently where I had the screen replaced before I upgraded my phone. Yeah. I made a genius bar appointment and then I ran the, my support, the, the support app and it's like, oh yeah, by the way, just thought you'd like to know that you have a support. Oh, it knew, yeah, it knows about your appointment too. Oh yeah, the Apple Store app. I didn't have the support app on my iPhone, but I had I was the one that booked the the appointment. So when we got within range of the Apple Store in the mall, of course it popped up and it's like, "Hey, go see a person, you have an appointment." It's like, "Yeah, cool, thanks." Nice. Yeah? Yeah. How do it stuff. know? <laughs> How do it? I know. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um we've got some cool stuff found to do. Let's do it, John. Shall we? Do we, do we, do we have it in us? I think we do. Uh, we will start with Bruce. Bruce says, given all the recent discussions about the limitations of APFS, here's a cool stuff found bound to make John happy. And John, the folks at Paragon software have made, they're the ones that, that made the thing where we could talk to NTFS volumes, right? Um, they made the APFS retrofit kit for Mac OS. And this is free, at least at the moment. I think it'll stay there. Uh, and it will run on 10.10 10 through 10.12, which is uh, Yosemite, El Capitan, and Sierra. And it adds read-only support for APFS volumes to all of those things. So if you have gone through the process like you have, John, where you have external drives that are APFS or you have to, you know, take a drive out of a dead Mac and mount it in something that's not running high Sierra, Yosemite, El Capitan and Sierra read only access to um, your APFS volume for free, which is very cool. If you ask me, I, w I wish Apple would do that, but it's, you know, it doesn't have to, right? You just download it for free. Good to go. Pretty good, right? Where do I know? Um, yeah, they also make some NTFS. Uh, That's what I just said. Yeah. They, yeah. Made, they make yeah. the NTFS stuff. Yeah. You must have been prepping something else. Yes. Okay. That's okay. No problem. No, was, yeah. Yeah. All right. You, you with me on this? Because I got some cool ones to talk about. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I've been testing out this thing called the MyScript Calculator 2. This is for iOS it, you can use your finger to draw calculations on the screen and then it turns them into numbers and they work and you can do some pretty crazy stuff with this, you know, division, like, like complex uh, equations. You can edit like it, as you're typing, it kind of turns them into real number as you're scratching, it turns them into real numbers. But if you made a, a mistake, you can like cross it out on the real number that it turned it into and write in your, um, you know, your, your replacement or whatever. It's pretty cool. And you can, you can do linked equations where it all just works together. It's really, really cool. So, I, you know, my script, the, mm -hmm. the folks that, that do all that stuff. So now calculator two. Kiwi Graham in the chat room says he thinks they do a handwriting iOS they do. keyboard. They're yeah. the oh, ones okay. that did that handwriting iOS keyboard. Okay. Yep. Okay. And so now they've built a calculator app that's like purpose built with this stuff. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty good. Pretty good, John. I know you're a calculator guy like me, so I thought you might like it. Yeah. Or a math guy. I, I remember uh, working with a working with a guy who used MathCAD, which I think is as similar as you, uh, but, but it doesn't know OCR your stuff. But. Right. 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 Yeah. Cool. Uh, let's see. Where are we here? We have from listener uh, Larry. Sorry. I was, I was jumping ahead of ourselves here. Uh, listener Larry says, Watcher, W-A-A-T-C-H-E-R.com. He says, Amazon is constantly changing prices based on inventory and interest, etc., Watcher with two A's continually watches prices and alerts you when there is a change. You can indicate an item you want. And every time the price drops, you'll get an email. He says, as a note, I've received as many as 20 price change alerts in one day for a single item. You can also indicate your desired price and set it and forget it. And when Watcher encounters the price, it places the order for you. The creator is making money uh, with referral links. Uh, so, you know, he's like, Make sure that if you use this service, click his links to, you know, support the app. So he says you can also use it in conjunction with your price match credit cards on stuff you've already bought 
And when you get the alerts, submit it to your credit card company and get your money back. He says, you could just use it to find a cheaper price to match for, um, buy it at Best Buy and track it at Watcher. When a cheaper price alert comes in, boom, get your money back from Best Buy too. He says, personally, I've saved some serious coin. So thanks, Larry. That's a good one. I had no idea. Pretty good. Right, John? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Hey, uh, lawyer Jeff chimed in with something. Actually, we ran a piece on it at Mac Observer about a week ago, but uh, Troy Hunt launched this website called Pwned Passwords, P-W-N-E-D. For those of you not up on uh, elite speak lingo, elite speak lingo. But uh, what it does is it checks to see if your passwords have been leaked on the Internet and they have more than 500 million passwords in the database. And so even if you think you have like a one time use pat or not a one time use, but a, you know, a unique password for a website, uh, it's possible that it's been leaked. And so you'd want to change it. Well, if you use the one password service, then you can it will automatically check all of your passwords against that database to and tell you which ones, uh, if any, have been leaked. So Look that's that. a pretty good one. Mon- monkey's been pwned. Can you Monkey? believe it? Can you believe what? it? <laughs> Dude, how did you know my password? Uh, sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> didn't mean to. It's been pwned. Not the word. It's been pwned. I, I, yeah, didn't, le- I didn't leak it out on you, man. Uh, the URL for Watcher to answer John Linthicum in the chat room at MacGeekab.com slash stream is Watcher with two A's. W-A-A-T-C-H-E-R. Very, very cool. Um, I've had the I opportunity. Have... Go ahead, John. What's that? Did you, did you mention... Sorry, again, I'm, I'm distracted here. because I'm Yeah, fo- focus on this stuff because it, it's good for us to have these these back and forth. So, yeah. Have you done have I been PWNED.com? No. I signed up for that once. No. Okay. Oh, yeah, I did good. that a long time ago. Yeah. It checks your and email it actually, address. Yeah, so you give it your email and then, yeah. So it sounds like a similar service to them. So uh, check that one out. Have I been PWNED.com? Oh, huh, cool. I'll put that in the list. Yeah. Huh. All right. Cool. Um, I've been playing lately. You know, I, I know you're a TiVo guy like me, John, and lots of our listeners are TiVo folks because, you know, they make life way easier. Um, I've been checking out the new TiVo Vox remotes lately. These things are pretty cool. It's a TiVo remote, but it has a microphone in it and you can pair it up with your TiVo. I think it's got to be uh, a bolt or or a Romeo or a TiVo mini. Um, and, and there's different models that you get uh, if you've got a Romeo or a mini, because you have to get the, the little receiver for it. But um, you can, it like supernatural language stuff, much better than I've experienced with vo- like voice assistants in, in general, but it is very specific, you know, because it's, it's the TiVo. And so it knows what kinds of things you might be asking it about. But you can do cool stuff like, hey, you know, um, you just push the button on the remote and you say, show me all, uh, y- you know, Chevy Chase movies and and then say from the 80s and, y- you know, or only vacation. And it just starts linking it together. But it like jumps you right around and jumps you right to what you want. And it will even build, like I said, um, show me Patriots games, right? And it brought me to a screen for Patriots football games that I didn't have never seen before. And then let me create a one pass that seemed way more intelligent than any one pass I've ever been able to create before. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. And they're, you know, it's like 40 bucks or whatever at Amazon. You can get one of these, these remotes. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, I didn't think we would, when they said, you know, when they showed it to me at CES, they're like, oh, we'll send you some to test out. And it's like, yeah, I, wow. Like we use it way more than I thought we would, but because it's sort of natural to just, you know, this is what I want to watch. Yeah, no, that is, that's cool. It's yeah. amazing where AI is going. I know. Yeah. 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 It's pretty good. You got one. Uh, you, 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 any questions on that or thoughts on that, John, before you move on? Nope. Okay, cool. Uh, you want to take, uh, take us to the next one, John? Yes. So I, uh, went through some of the goodies that I've gotten at, at recent shows here. I finally took some time to do that. It's a tough life, you know? Yeah. But, um, here's a, what I think is a, a unique product. It's called the Halo Go Drive Pro. 
Okay. And so what it is, is it's a lightning cable. So it has the lightning plug on one end, which you plug into your iDevice. Sure. And on the other end is a USB connector. But here's the clever part. Inside the USB connector, connector, you put a micro SD card. Okay. And, and what can you do with it? So you can do a whole bunch of things. So it'll, uh, like some similar bridge products, like a SanDisk, you know, we've mentioned, uh, make some of these as well, which has USB on the, and, and perform a similar function, but I think it's unique enough. So it can do backup of your photo and video from sure. your device yep. to yep. the SD card. Uh, it'll show you your photos in, in a timeline. You can even snap things from your camera directly to the SD card. So that's kind of neat. That is cool. So it's circum. Huh. So it, yeah. Um, you can play music and videos. Um, you can share the devices on it. Um, it, it, I had a little trouble with this, but, um, uh, you can share things either from the app to other apps or from other apps to it. Okay. Um, and you can save it within the app. You can save things from within the app itself. Um, and it also, of course, acts as a charging cable. Oh, so it's kind no of kidding. <laughs> three things in one. Yeah. So wow. the US, uh, that's like the um, perfect little travel yeah. companion. Yeah, that was my thought. And, and if you, uh, though, I kind of, I didn't read the instructions, which, you know, my bad here. So the first thing I did is, you know, I plug, plugged in the, my computer and it mounted the uh, SD card as a, as a, as a drive. And then I tried plugging it in to the, uh, iDevice and, the app didn't recognize it. And I'm like, oh, it must be broken or something like that. The thing is, if you plug it in as a drive, that's the functionality that you get. If you plug it into the phone and the USB is not plugged into anything, then the app can talk to it. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah, that, of course. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Huh. That was my little fumble. But um, pretty handy. They're, they're in the UK. Okay. Um, I got it, got it at yeah recent show. Um, it's 19... 99 pounds but you can get it and you have to pay for shipping which i don't think you want to do from the uk it, so um, is it but they not available it, in the u.s yet oh no they have it in amazon oh, I'm, oh I'm okay try to link oh yeah okay, i have it in perfect. my notepad here there, there's a link okay. on amazon all right, right so, so 24.99 and uh you provide your own micro sd i think they say up to a uh, 512 gigs yeah yeah i'm pretty sure that's yeah. uh, cool so cool, cool. That's number one. All right, yeah. cool. Hey, um, before we move on, and because these things are cool stuff found, it's not even that we're moving on. We're just staying with cool stuff found. I want to uh, I want to talk about both of our sponsors today, John. If that works for you, absolutely. All right, our first sponsor today certainly falls into the category of cool stuff found, and that is Ring. I've known about Ring for a little while because I knew that they made this video doorbell, but I'd never tried one until recently. So I've tried not only their video doorbell, but also their video floodlight camera. The idea behind this is pretty simple. You've got these devices on the outside of your house. They can track motion. They can see what's going on and they can provide two way communication. So from my iPhone, I can see who's at my door or who's in my driveway because I have a floodlight cam aimed that way at any time, right? No matter where I am or what I'm doing, I can go and activate these cameras and see them. But if there's motion and it's cool because you can go in the app and set these things, I can get an alert that there's motion and then I can go see these things. Like I said, it's a one way camera. I'm the only one that can see, but it's a two way uh, audio device so I can talk to these people and hear them whoever's there in my driveway let me play a clip that uh, that they sent us from from one of their things here hey sorry we're uh, in the middle of dinner can I help you yes how are you good how are you good I haven't seen you in a while I don't know who you are I'm Justin I, I don't know you Justin I met you a long time ago when I was younger no I'm sorry you're in the wrong place yeah, so I don't know if that guy was like a crook or just truly in the wrong place, but either way, right, it doesn't matter. She didn't have to open the door. She didn't even have to be home. 
Right. And that's the cool part. Like in our house, our living room is kind of on the like our driveway is on the, the south side of the house. It like our our house is sort of sideways to the to the driveway. So the driveway is on the side of the house. Our living room is on the north side of the house. If we're expecting someone or especially if we're not, we can't really sit in the living room and monitor what's going on in the driveway. Well, now with Ring, we don't even have to. We certainly can. We could have our phone or our iPad, you know, up showing the live view of the driveway, but we can also get a notification that says, Hey, there's somebody in your driveway and you sort of like, it's cool. Once you set up the camera, you draw these things, like I said, and it, it, uh, it, like on the picture and, and you can choose where in the camera's field of view triggers a motion event. And then we can just look and it's like, Oh, Hey, you know, I can say to one of my kids, like your rides here or whatever. It's really, really cool stuff. And I can save you some money. So you can save up to 150 bucks on a ring of security kit at ring.com slash M G G. Again, that's ring.com slash M G G save 150 bucks. When you go to ring.com slash M G G, you got to check this out. This is the coolest new gadget that I've used in a while. In fact, my wife says this is the best gadget that I've ever brought into the house. So check it out. Ring.com slash MGG. Our thanks to Ring for sponsoring this episode. Our second sponsor for today is also a new sponsor and also falls into the category of cool stuff found. It's Molecule. We're at M O L E K U L E dot com. You can get this really awesome air purifier. Like my wife has had allergies. We all suffer from allergies, right? We lived in Austin, Texas, which is like the allergy capital of the world. And it kind of lingers with you after that. Once you start suffering, it never goes away. Well, the molecule folks, uh, didn't like the fact that we had this, you know, really old, like 70 year old technology on HEPA filters that, was like the best thing we could use for, you know, clearing allergens out of our home. Cause our indoor air is like way more filled with this, this crap than the outdoor air generally is. I mean, unless you live next door to, you know, some like pollutant factory or something, but generally speaking, you know, your indoor air is what really needs to be purified. And so they developed this, this thing that they call, it is called photo electrochemical oxidation. And what it does is it not only traps these things that are a thousand times smaller than a HEPA filter can, but it also then kills them off, right? So a HEPA filter just tracks, traps them, but it's still right there. This actually kills them off. And they, they say one customer said she was able to breathe through her nose for the first time in 15 years. We set this thing up and I can attest to this. We set it up. And I, I, we put it in our bedroom to begin with. We've tried it in different rooms of the house and it's really actually made a huge difference everywhere we've put it. Uh, I walked into the bedroom maybe 20 minutes after this thing started and it was still in what it called its initial processing mode or whatever. Dude, this thing, like the air in that room, I've never experienced this before in my house. I, you know, I could feel it like in my, in my nasal cavity. It was just like, oh, this air is clean. So good. And it's super easy to set up. It's even got an app where you connect it to your Wi-Fi and then you can check the status of the filters. They'll automatically send you filters because the thing knows and it can talk back to the, you know, mothership of molecule or whatever. And you can save 75 bucks. So again, go to molecule, M O L E K U L E dot com. And at checkout, enter promo code M G G. Th this thing truly has been life changing inside our house. It's, it's really, really quite something. And um, I, you got to check it out again. Molecule M O L E K U L E dot com pr promo code. <laughs> easy for me to say. MGG will get you 75 bucks off of this really killer, super simple to use air filter, air purifier. It, it really is. It's a, I mean, it's all of that and it really destroys all the pollutants in your air. Check it out. Our thanks to molecule with a K for sponsoring this episode. Up next. So this is something I actually spent my own coin on. Wasn't a lot of coin, but uh, looks like it has a lot of features for uh, what I paid, Dave. It's the iClever 
10,000 milliamp hour portable solar power bank. Huh. So really, obviously, it's 10,000 milliamp hour. Yeah, it's, pretty good. it's uh it's about the size of uh, maybe uh, two iPhones stacked on top of one another. So it's 10,000 milliamp hours. You can charge it either through USB and it has two USB ports, one regular power, one high power. And it also has a solar cell. So if you want to, uh, it's not going to charge as fast as the solar cells is through USB, but you know, if you're out in the sun and you want to top it off, it's good for that. The lights will blink if it gets enough solar energy. Okay. It also has a flashlight. And they also claim it is, I forget the specification, uh, water resistant, let's call it. I wouldn't okay. say waterproof. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pro- it probably is, but you know, a lot, a lot I think of they gave things, the, the yeah. rating. They say it's IP, uh, IP, uh, whatever it is. Um, huh. But there you go. And quickly, the deal thing. So the thing is, the, the, the original, I think I got it on Thrifter and it yep. was nineteen ninety nine. I paid on Amazon. And then I found through this other plugin, Dave, um, uh, the Honey one, it's yeah. down to seventeen ninety nine. Oh, so, uh, nice. Yeah, we talked about Honey before. We but, did. Um, yeah, I'll put a, I'll put a link in the uh, in the show notes. And they also have a, a from what I saw, a, a, they kind of integrate with Amazon, and they'll say, "Oh yeah, if you want a, an alert on this, um, right?" So they they also do the uh, price tracking, which is kind of cool. But cool. Um, I think it's a great travel travel battery pack. Cool. Hey, um, I'll, kind of along the same lines, I have been checking out this thing from my charge called the Adventure Jump Start. So it it too is a battery pack. Now, as a battery pack, it's sixty six hundred milliamp hours, right? So plenty to recharge your iPhone a couple of times, maybe even three times, um, enough to top off your iPad. But the unique feature of this one is that the amperage that it can put out blows away any other battery pack. It can do a 400 amp peak jump start current and a 200 amp jump start current. And it comes with jumper cables to plug it to connect to your car. So you keep this thing in your car, you keep it charged up. And when you need a jump, you give it to yourself Right then and there, you just connect it up to the, you know, either the terminals on your battery or whatever you're supposed to do in your car. And that might be different, but, um, but you just connect it up, connect it to the, uh, you know, to the, my charge jump adventure, jumpstart thing and boom, start your car. You're up and running, which I think is pretty cool. Um, I, you know, I, I now have these in our cars because in the winter, especially when we get those single digit temperatures, you leave your car for too long. Uh, you might wind up with a battery issue. So I don't know. Absolutely. The yeah. older it gets. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so, yep. Some yeah, serious wow, energy in the, in those things. No wonder they don't want them in the belly. That's airplanes. tiny. <laughs> I have one it's of these tiny. huge monsters. I, I got, I got one of these huge monstrous ones that weighs like probably like, you know, 10 or 15. Oh pounds. no, this yeah. thing's, this thing's not much bigger than like your iPhone. Yeah. And in, in that sense. Yeah. Oh, I know. Amazing. It's pretty cool. Yep. Yep, and it's a hundred bucks at least on their site. It's a hundred bucks. Maybe it's maybe you can get it cheaper on Amazon too. Check one of the various things that we've talked about to find that. Uh, the iPhone ten, you know, is uh, it's got like a, a, a interesting uh, curve and all that to the surface. So uh, I've been checking out the invisible invisible shield glass and Lux three hundred and sixty from zag this thing is so cool it's a it's actually a two-part tempered glass shield one that goes on the front and one that goes on the back and it works really it it like feels good it goes on super easy they have like a little uh kit that that helps you get it totally perfectly lined up which is really the hard thing when you're doing the glass because you don't want to have to take it off and put it back on because then you risk dust kind of getting vacuum sucked in there when you when you peel it back up so yeah pretty good stuff so that's uh i I'm, i put one of those on my iphone 10 and it I, I forget that it's on there it just it looks normal it actually has a colored bezel it's a, a black bezel uh on the one that i have but i i don't like i don't notice it because it's black against the iphone's black and just feels good works with a case it's great so i like it good yeah, John. Mm-hmm. Cool. A couple more cool stuffs found to uh, to add. 
we've long been fans of Edemotix headphones here. I think when we started doing the show, uh, at least at least you and maybe even me were using their old ER sixes um, on the uh, the for, you know for our in ear monitoring while we were doing the show. Well, uh, they've come out with new. Uh, a new set of headphones and these are the ER fours and these things are, it, it's cool. They uh, I'm trying to pull it up here. They have it on their website and I pulled up the wrong thing and now I'm all confused, but I'll get there. So there's two models. There's the um, reference or studio response. And then there's the extended response of these ER fours. And I asked him to send me the, the studio response because, or the studio reference, uh, because I, I tend not to like too much low end in, in my sound. They accidentally sent me the extended response ones with, which they say have more low end. And I actually think they, these sound great. Like the, the, whatever they've done to the extended response really fills it out without it sounding, you know, it doesn't have, it doesn't sound like those beats headphones. Right. Um, really nice sound. My guess is the studio reference um, would sound more like a studio reference monitor, which is more flat response and maybe not quite as musical. I don't know. I haven't tested them, but that would be my guess. But, um, but these extended response ones sound, they just sound great. They're super comfortable in the ear. Uh, they, they have that triple flange thing that Edemotic is sort of known for. I don't know if they were the ones that pioneered it. They may well have been, but those triple flanged um, earpieces last a long time, way more than the foam ones do. They really seal and fit in the ear comfortably. So uh, I'm stoked to see Edemotic doing this stuff now. It's, uh, it's always good. Always good. One of our, one of our favorite brands. And it come it does come with the foam ones if you prefer those and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, we'll put a link to those in the show notes. Good stuff. Thoughts on that, John? Are you I still, still got the you're ER6 not, is kicking around somewhere. Do you really? Yeah. Those, those ER6s, I mean, they're, you know, that's the thing is they last, right? Well, uh, I like them also because the, the, the seal is good enough where actually a lot of times I'll, I'll use them when flying if I remember. Sure. Right. Yeah. That's, they're great for that because they're just out of the way and the ER4s are the same way. They're just small and out of the way. But yeah, you put these in when you're flying and you're not going to hear anything around you, which is it's key. I talked last year, right about this time, about a 27-inch display that I bought from Monoprice. And then I proceeded to talk about how it didn't want to wake up when the, uh, with my Mac, right? I either had to restart my Mac or power cycle the display. There's just some issue with, with that particular 27-inch you know, 4K display from Monoprice. Well... There's a new one, the 27-inch UHD IPS 4K Ultra Slim aluminum monitor from Monoprice that I've been using uh, for a couple of months now. And I was hesitant to talk about it until I really had the opportunity to test it for a longer period of time to make sure that it always wakes up. It always wakes up. It knows the Mac. It knows whatever it needs to know. And it, man, it looks great if your Mac supports retina displays. This will your, your Mac will then see this as a retina capable display in that way where it'll it'll do higher density for, uh, you know, for uh, just like a retina display does it. It'll your Mac will see it this way. So depending on your Mac's video capabilities, even if your Mac isn't retina capable, it will see this as a retina capable display. But again, depending on how much VRAM you have, it may or may not be able to fully take advantage uh, of it. But man, it just, it looks great. Always wakes up. I've had it at my desk in my office, like I said, for a couple of months and it, it, you know, it's just an extension of my Mac now. Really, really nice stuff. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Good stuff. You got one last cool stuff found for us, John. I got one last one, Dave, Cool. that I did get at a show. All right. And it's from a company called BioKey and they call it their BioKey, BioKey Touch Lock. Okay. Well, you can probably guess what mechanism you use in order to open and close it. Well, closing it is easy, but how do you open it? You use your fingerprint. It's like a Touch ID lock. Really? I think that's pretty much... Yeah, yeah that's um, it, right? Yeah. 
huh. pretty much pulled it out of the pack here. So, uh, you know, if you want to program a fingerprint, uh, you hold down the uh, uh, latch part, uh, and then an LED comes on, and it says, okay, register your fingerprint. You hold your fingerprint there. Huh. And then um, and then I use my fingerprint to open it. Um, but you can also use it for, uh, for family and friends. It'll store up to 20 fingerprints. They have various colors and designs. Wow. Um, and you got to charge and it has a USB port where you can uh, charge it as well. Hmm. But I think it lasts, uh, lasts a pretty long time. So, um, and I looked at this company, these guys make a, a ton of fingerprint uh, scanning uh, verification products. So sure. Mostly it looks like for windows, but um, they've been, it looks like they've been doing this thing for a long time here, but I uh, thought it was pretty, pretty elegant. That's pretty um, cool, man. Huh. Look at that. Yeah, I saw they had another one that was like a, a TSA type. I was one. just going to so ask if it, they had a TSA approved version of this because that yes. would that would be the next question. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, they got that. They got a. Uh, um, yeah, ch- check out the site. You cool. know, link to this product and look at some of the other things. But yeah. it, you know, I was able to figure it out within a you know a couple of minutes. So very cool. Very cool. Cool. Uh, you know, I want to take uh, a minute as we always do and thank our premium subscribers that contributed this week. Uh, But really, you know, again, as I said at the beginning of this, you know, 700 episodes, it's all about you. You folks are the, like, we love doing this, but we do it for you. And, and it's you that really makes us stop and make sure we've got things the best we can for you and put on the best show we possibly can every week. So thank you to all of you. And for this week, uh, specific thanks out on our biannual plan at 25 bucks every six months. Anthony B, Joe B, Eric R, Drake Z, and Terry O. And then on our monthly $10 plan, Abdullah B, Paul M, Mike C, Mike Mark R, Dave C, Pierre Timo, Neil L, and Frank A. And then a one-time contribution of 25 bucks from Mark S. Thank you so much to all of you. If you want to learn more about that, of course, macgeekab.com slash premium if you are interested and able. And if you're not, that's it's okay. It, like, keep sending in your questions. Keep listening. Like I said earlier, you know, when we put sponsors in the show, which we usually have, go check out their stuff. That's that's all we ask. It, if, if, if it turns out to be something that's going to be good for you and you want to buy, awesome. But our job is to get you to check it out and, and generate some interest. And so hopefully we're doing that and we really appreciate it when you, when you follow through on that stuff, that makes a huge difference for us. So thank you. All right. Uh, we think we've got time for a couple of tips and maybe some follow ups. So a quick tip that kind of falls into the cool stuff found, uh, revisited category, because I think we've talked about this before is from listener, David, who shares that uh, if your AirPods are lost, you can use the Find My iPhone app to find them. But this only works if they're out of the case because they need to be in a mode where they're wanting to pair with your phone. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And that's change it, Apple. Yeah, no kidding. Where's my case? (laughs) Where's where are my AirPods? I've gone a week without using my AirPods because I, I lose them. So. Um, I get, so I have this it, catalyst case for the AirPods that I keep them in and that for some reason, having them in this case, probably cause it has this little carabiner thing on it, um, makes it so that I, I don't lose them, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So do they have to be in Bluetooth range? Yes. Yeah. AirPods okay. are Bluetooth only. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder so. if they give you last known location. They will. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, I mean, these things are tiny. No, I know it. You know, know it's in your house. My sister's boyfriend lost his right one or one one of the two Mm -hmm. within hours of first getting them. What a bummer. And when you, when you play the find my app, it makes a sound out of the AirPods. So they they were on a busy New York street and went back and looked for it and it was, yeah, it was gone. gone. It was a bummer, but that's a bummer. But yeah, no, that's, I've actually managed to use that to find it in the, yeah. cushion it fell out of my pocket and down into there so make okay. sure it's not in your ear when you do this because right. the, the sound yes. is loud yeah yes. <laughs> so cool thanks david thanks for the reminder on that and then from brother jay 
Uh, we were having a crazy conversation via email about all kinds of like firewalls and and he wants to do some things where he routes traffic only from his Plex server to a, a, a VPN, but not other things. And so or not, not he wants to route his Plex server, not through a VPN so he can access it from the outside, but he wants to do other things. And Apple's firewall uses there's all kinds. It's it, of course, it's Unix based. Um, the, it, there are several different Unix, common Unix utilities that are the, the basis or the foundation of most firewalls. Those are things like IP tables, IPFW or IP chains. Apple doesn't use any of those. Apple uses something called PF. Uh, and then there is a command line control called PFCTL that I've never used to manage a firewall, but certainly you could. Brother Jay reminds me and reminds us of something we have mentioned before and cool stuff found called Murus, M-U-R-U-S at MurusFirewall.com that is a graphical interface to PF. PF stands for packet filter, uh, as I'm told. So you can do a lot of things. I'm sure there's some things that PF will do that Murus hasn't built into the the graphical app, but it doesn't look like that list is all that long. This seems pretty full featured and you get to do it all graphically. So go ahead and check out Muris firewall. If you, uh, if you're, if you're of that ilk. So thanks for the reminder, brother Jay. Good stuff. Uh, all right. Two things from, uh, Robin and one, or uh, sorry, two things from Simon and one from Robin following up from the last show, episode six ninety nine. Robin writes us and says we were talking about Chi chargers uh, in the last show. And Robin says, I've enjoyed uh, that ep- that segment. I also bought several of them. And one thing I've noticed is that when my iPhone 10 is completely drained, it cannot be charged by Chi. It only works when I first connect via the cable to give it an initial load to the iPhone. Did you experience the same? I, I do remember this. I This happened only once for me. But yeah, I, I wasn't able to get it to, to kind of pair with the Chi coil uh, when it was dead. Um, I don't know if that's how it's supposed to be, but it's certainly, I guess it makes sense if there's a truly a pairing thing. Although the Apple Watch will pair when dead with, with its wireless charging thing, which we, as we said last week, is kind of sort of Chi, but not really. So have you, have you had a dead phone yet, John, and tried to revive it with a Chi charge? Um, no. Okay. Okay. No, I have run it all the way down. Sure. But then, yeah, I plugged it in. Plugged yeah, I haven't in. tried that yet. I'll, yeah. I'll have to see if, uh, see what the, how the seven reacts. Uh, the eight, eight reacts. I was just going to say, you don't have an eight. Yeah. You, have, you don't have a seven. You have an eight. Yeah. Uh, Simon, the wrote in again, regarding Chi. we were talking about putting it on your bedside table and finding something that didn't have a bright light shining all night. And he found at Ikea of all places, the Rollin. That's a R A L L E N with an umlaut over the a. So almost in spinal tap world here with the way these things look. But anyway, uh, the Rollin is a chi charger that has uh, a, uh, it, it's shape is, uh, it's almost conical in a sense. And it says that you use a fix a hole saw F I X a, you could just lay this thing on your, on your desk or your bedside table, but you can also drill a hole that this thing will just drop into. And then it lies flush and flat with your either desktop or bedside table. And Simon says that the light is, uh, he says it's designed to be installed into a desktop. I bought it and drilled the hole. Uh, it is sunk into the tabletop and looks great. Almost invisible. The led is white and is off when not charging and it's white when charging. But as this charger is so small, the light is covered by the phone and you can't see it if you have your phone on top of it, but it also does flash if there's a problem. So he says, I love it. And it's hidden well inside my desk. So very cool stuff. We will uh, of course put a link in the show notes to that. I love these nice. kinds of things. Yeah, it's pretty you don't good. Have, you don't have to assemble it yourself, right? No. No, you, if you want to drill it, that you've got to do on your own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mama right. wouldn't be happy if I did that to the bedside table. Right. That's the thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. Uh, 
And then also from Simon from episode 699, we were talking about uh, email and push notifications and all of that stuff. And uh, it was Simon's question, I believe. But he says, I started using an email app called Spark. It's available on both Mac and iOS, and it gives me instant notifications similar to push and also allows me to use multiple from addresses. He says it's great. And I've decided to use it as my main mail client. Very easy to set up and it syncs settings across multiple platforms. So there you go. Uh, we've mentioned spark on the show before it's from the folks at Riedel, uh, R E A D D L E. Uh, but we'll put a link to spark. I think it's spark mail And I've, I've tested spark. It's actually quite good. I, you know, I have a hard time changing mail apps. I and mean, that's always like a big commitment, but, um, but I, I've very, been very impressed with Spark uh, as far as, th- you know, third party mail clients go. I, it's, uh, I think it's the best I've, I've checked out. So, yeah, lots of people in the chat room saying the same thing. So it's good. It's good. Any uh, any thoughts on that, John? I have I have it installed and I get updates for it, but I haven't uh, actually used it. As you don't use it actively. Client. Got it. Got it. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> well... Despite the fact that in the middle of the show, I screwed up the timing and I have no idea where we are on the time. I actually do have some idea and it's time. We got to go. We got to go. The band somehow knows when to start playing. The music just magically knows. That's right. If there there is a podcast, um, it's totally not safe for anyone ever anywhere. (laughs) So bear that in mind. (laughs) Right. So don't listen to it. But no, it's called the uh, 10 minute podcast and it's three comedians uh, completely irreverent, but um, they have their theme music always playing, but it, it has a gap of silence. And the show is exactly 10 minutes long because the music starts fading in as they're approaching the 10 minute mark. And that's it. That's it. It's a hard break, man. It's a hard <laughs> break. That's it. Yep. So. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's been some episodes where I wish the music hadn't come in and some where it's like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, don't listen to it. I can't recommend it at all. Uh, visit us on Facebook, MacGeekUp.com slash Facebook. Visit us. Uh, you can send us email. Feedback at MacGeekUp.com. No, 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 no. Feedback at MacGeekCab.com. No, I, I, I heard Dave say feedback at MacGeekCab.com. I, I, I don't know it. what you guys are talking about. I said premium at MacGeekCab.com for all of the folks that are premium members that can use that address and get faster responses, generally speaking. Uh, or you can call us at 224-888-GEEK, which, John, is? 4335. Find one last place where they can find us, Mr. Braun. Oh my gosh. Um, I guess it would have to be Twitter. All right. I am John F. Braun. He is Dave Hamilton. That other guy is Pilot Pete. The podcast is MacGeekab, and the publication is Mac Observer. All at twitter.com. Sweet. That's uh, that's what we got this time. I want to thank, of course, all our sponsors. We've got Ring at ring.com slash MGG. Molecule with a K. Uh, with coupon code MGG. Of course, in the podcast marketplace, we've got Smile at smilesoftware.com slash podcast. Otherworld Computing at maxsales.com. Barebones Software at barebones.com. Our thanks to Cashfly, C-A-C-G-F-L-Y dot com. All of that can be found at maccheekup.com slash sponsors, too. At any time, all the deals, we keep them up to date there. That's right. Pete. What do you have to say? Anything? Any yeah. lasting advice? Yeah, all this cool stuff found, all this stuff you're advertising. Oh, man, my wallet. Oh. <laughs> oh, no, wasn't that? Okay. And that's why I love this show, but boy, is it expensive to listen yeah, that, to. Yeah, we guys. know. The cool stuff found <laughs> episodes are costly. We, yeah, we're aware. Yeah, 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 good yeah. stuff. But yeah. um, For us, so, too. Yeah. So, yeah. But if you're going to go out and spend that money, you know, and mama's looking through your wallet later, uh, all I can tell you is don't get caught. Made up.